So this is about listening, because we all listen. It, it seems so basic, but the truth is we all listen. Uh, we listen uh, even if we can't hear. Uh, some people are hearing impaired. I wear hearing aids. Other people can't hear at all. But we find a way to listen because listening is an important part of communication. We can't communicate if we can't listen, all right? We can't communicate with the world uh, at all if our listening is totally impaired. And so even people who can't hear find ways to listen and communicate. It's very simple. If I say something like, hi, how are you? You all have something in your head to say, right? It's like, I'm fine, or okay, or I'm doing great, school's got out, or something like that. You're going to say something because you have learned how to listen and how to respond to it. When we listen, we're not just listening to words, okay? We're listening to how those words are put together. We're listening to the tone by which they're said. Um, We... Um, listen to inflections and emphasis and even things like nonverbals like moving your hands or raising your eyebrows or whatever it is when you're speaking. You do all of that so you can listen. Listening is vital to our existence. You can say something like, you're not listening. And we can hear that and say, but maybe I am. I often hear it like this, you're not listening. Perhaps some of the children have heard it that way too. My wife says it to me because of my hearing aids. You're not listening. And I'm saying, I can't hear, right? (laughs) Our text is a lot, has a lot to do about listening. Actually, this particular text is a tremendously good text. There's probably a half a dozen sermons you could, you could uh, write about this text all by itself. But listening, it struck me that listening was a really, really important component in this text. And so we're going to look at the listening aspects this morning. However, to do that, we need to get some background to this story. Um, In particular, uh, what is the deal between Jews and Samaritans? Because you're going to get a line, a parenthetical line in there that says, Jews did not associate with Samaritans, okay? So what does that mean? Uh, This is the divide between Jews and Samaritans. You need to know some history there to figure that out. The first thing you need to know that way back when, when there was a guy by the name of uh, Jacob who became Israel, he had 12 sons. And those 12 sons became the nation of Israel. They had kids and their kids had kids and, and they became this nation and they're the ones who crossed the desert and got to the promised land and all that. All right. So there was no such thing as Jews versus Samaritans back then. Then along comes uh, kings. And so you got King Saul and you got King David and King Solomon. And then they have a little hiccup in the process. And so the power of the throne is not centralized anymore. And so there's two kings the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And in that situation, what happens is they begin to look at each other differently. They're still brothers, sisters, cousins, they're family, but they're still like, oh, you do your thing, we do our thing, right? So it's a political leadership kind of change going on. Then uh, the northern kingdom is invaded by the Assyrians. So the Assyrian army comes in from the north and conquers 10 of the 12 tribes. All right? So the 10 brothers and the two brothers become 
even more distance by default because the Assyrians have conquered those 10 tribes. The problem comes then with the occupation by the Assyrians. During the occupations, uh, they married some of the Assyrians, so intermarriage takes place. And now the Jews in the southern kingdom are going, what's going on here? I think their blood is being mixed with the Jewish blood, and that's not good. That makes them impure. That makes them defiled or half-blood. If you think about the Harry Potter stories, that's the underlying theme, and that is the pure bloods versus the muggles or the half-bloods, and that's the the storyline is there, and that's the same kind of idea. What you think is pure versus what you think is not, and the fear in that for those who are pure is that somehow they will become defiled. Somehow God will not accept them if they're not pure. So that means you can't associate with them. You can't be their friends. And pretty soon you no longer like them. You hate them. Uh, You don't accept them. You fear them. And this builds over thousands of years. And so it gets to the point where anything a Samaritan has touched is defiled. And so you have to wash it off ritually before you can even use it. And um, they change worship centers. So the Jews say it's Jerusalem and the temple. The Samaritans say, no, it is in Samaria at Mount Gerizim. And they change their cultures and things go farther and farther and farther apart until the point where Jews say, we're not even going there. So even though the short distance from Jerusalem to Galilee is right straight through Samaria, they won't do it. They will go all the way to the east across the Jordan River. They will go all the way to the north around the Lake Sea of Galilee to get to uh, the Galilee where they feel other Jews are, and it's a safe place to be. So they won't even go through there. So there is this huge divide that is part of this deal. Um, <coughs> excuse me. The, um, the text then uh, doesn't spell all that out, but this is what's in, in the underlying part of the text. And so we're going to read through this. Um, It's a little bit long, but I think it's really important to have it all so that we can work our way through it and get what God is telling us about listening this morning. So I'm going to read it, and we're going to see what it says. Now, Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, that meaning John the Baptist, Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who was baptizing, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now, he had to go through Samaria, chose to go through Samaria. So he came to it until he came to the town called Sychar, near the plot of ground where Jacob had given to his son Joseph Uh, Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well, and it was about noon. When the Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it was who asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us a well to drink, a well and drank from it himself? as did his sons and his flocks and his herds. Jesus answered, 
Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and, I, and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go back to your husband. Go, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right. When you say you have no husband, the fact is you have had five husbands and the man you are with now is not your husband. What you have said, just said, is true. And I'm going to get my water here a minute before I, where did I put it? Oh. Did it fall on the floor there? <laughs> just, thank you. <coughs> Sorry about that. Well, going to be one of those, I guess. All right. The woman said to her, I see you are a prophet. Uh, our ancestors worshiped in the mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the, in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that the Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Just then, the disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking to a woman. But no one asked, what do you want, or... Why are you talking to her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town and said to the people, Come, see the man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way towards him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying, it's still four months until harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe with harvest. Even now, those who reap draw their wages. Even now, they harvest the crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows, another reaps, is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves and know that the man really is the Savior of the world. This is the word of the Lord. Okay. In this text, there are five different listeners. There's a couple of groups and a couple of individuals. The first group is right at the beginning. It's the Pharisees. The Pharisees are the religious leaders of the day, 
and uh, they keep tabs on things. And they've been watching Jesus because he's a rabbi and he's teaching and they want to make sure he's teaching the right thing. Problem is, Jesus isn't teaching what, what they're teaching. And he's gaining followers and he's becoming more and more popular. And they accuse him of baptizing, and even though he isn't doing that, they say, you're baptizing them. And uh, so they're worried. They're afraid. They're concerned that Jesus is somehow going to turn their lives upside down. They are afraid. They're afraid of losing what they have. They have uh, all the influence. They have the power. They have the, the wealth. They have the education. They have everything. And they're afraid that Jesus is going to turn this all uh, upside down. And so they don't want to listen. They are though they are the group that does not listen. It's really interesting. Um, They have hardened their hearts towards Jesus, and this hardness is causing them to be unwilling to see what the Scripture really is teaching. This Scripture is something they love. This Scripture is something they study every day. This Scripture is important to their lives, but because they don't like Jesus and they're afraid of him, their ears and their minds will not listen. The Pharisees were sure they were right. They knew the right answers. They had all the right answers. And therefore, Jesus wasn't. And therefore, they missed the Messiah they desperately wanted. These are the people that don't listen. The second group are the disciples themselves. I call them confused listeners or partially listening, partially listening uh, uh, listeners. They're confused. This whole business of the, the, the divide between Jews and Samaritans They've lived with that all their life. That's been around for thousand years. And so they get to this point, and, and now Jesus wants to drag them through Samaria. He wants to stop at a town. He wants to get a drink from some woman who he doesn't know and is a Samaritan. You know, one thing, it's, it's one thing to kind of sneak through there. It's another thing to stop and talk to people. They're very confused about this because that's not the way it's supposed to be. It's also difficult because they have lived with all this all their life, and then Jesus comes along, and he says, follow me, and they give up their whole life. Whatever they were doing, they gave it up for him, and that's great. That's what they're supposed to do, and so they did that. But now, after he gives this all up, and they go follow Jesus, he's dragging them through Samaria, and he's saying things they don't understand, and this is really, really difficult. It's a hard place for them to be in. The good news is that they hang in there. Uh, Even though they don't understand very well, they are committed to Jesus. And so they stay, and they follow Jesus. And they trust, even though they don't have good understanding. The third group, or in this case it's a person, is the Samaritan woman herself. Now she is very unique to this story because she is a person with all kinds of barriers. Um, There is no such thing as equal rights. There is no such thing as women's rights. There is no such thing of any of that in this point in time. And so, as a woman, she is considered to be, at best, property, although someone may love her and care for her and all that kind of stuff. That's not the point. But uh, legally, she's property. And so, she has no standing in the community that way. Secondly, she's a Samaritan woman. And so, in the eyes of the Jew, she is impure, defiled, and so on. Thirdly, she's a woman of questionable moral character because she is living with a man who she is not married to. And the fact is she's probably, she's had five other husbands along the way. So 
her standing in the community would not be great. She would be looked on as an outcast in the community. So things like mingling with the other women in town wasn't something that was a fun thing for her. That's why she probably went at noon to draw her water because she missed the ladies in the morning and the evening and that way she was just fine with that. She didn't have to hear them and what they said. They didn't have to see her and talk about her. That was her life. But in spite of these barriers, this woman comes to this place and listens to a Jewish man someone she has no business talking to, and he has no business talking to her. And yet, they have this conversation because it is a God-ordained conversation. She asks really good questions. She starts with the cultural stuff. He says, well, how can you talk to me when I'm, I'm me and you're you? And he says, we can do that, right? Um... He's, she has religious questions about, well, you Jews think that you got to worship Jesus, uh, you worship God in Jerusalem, and, and we think it's uh, Samaria, Mount Gerizim. What's the dip? You know, she asks those questions. That's a really good question to kind of ferret out religious kinds of issues. She finally gets to the point where she says, I don't know what's going on here. But I know this, the Messiah's coming and he's going to tell us what's right. So I'm trusting in him. And at that point, this is where Jesus reveals himself. I am he, he says. I'm the one. He, in that moment, to her personally, a Jewish man talking to a Samaritan woman says, I am the Messiah and she believes, and she is changed forever. Because of her listening, she, was, she listened well. She listened thoughtfully. She asked good questions. She wanted to understand. The fourth group are the townspeople themselves. They are a group, I say, are prepared to listen, prepared by someone else in advance to listen. So, knowing this woman, she comes running into town after she talks to Jesus, and she starts talking to the townspeople. And I would guess that at first she probably had to, you know, say a couple things to get some people's attention. But once she got their attention, she told them about Jesus and all that he'd done for her, how he knew her life, and everything she could. She told them she was... She was so utterly convinced, her testimony is so powerful that they go out to see Jesus to find out for themselves. And so they have been prepared to go do this. There's no way before that they would have left their town to go out to a well to talk to some Jewish guy sitting there. They just wouldn't have done it. And yet, here they are prepared to do that by this Samaritan woman. And so they go out, and they listen, and they believe. And that's pretty amazing. They are so convinced that they invite Jesus and the disciples to stay. A thousand years of separation have now been undone in a couple of minutes. Think about that. They stayed for two days. They didn't stay at the Holiday Inn and drop in at the community center they lived with them because they didn't have hotels, small towns. They didn't have big rooming houses. They stayed in the houses with people. They interacted with them every day for two days, talking about the things that were important, the living water they needed, the food that Jesus was foregoing for the work that he was doing. Then there's Jesus. He is the, the one person in this that is always listening well. He is the one person that teaches them and us how to listen. He speaks with words that make a difference. His actions 
are ones that cause us to look at life differently. It's no mistake that he dragged his disciples to the middle of Samaria because he had to teach them that there is no barrier for Jesus. There is no barrier for the gospel that by God's grace and mercy, anyone can come to Jesus and know him and receive the living water. He teaches them how to listen in a way that allows them to become who God intends them to become. He calls it living water. Living water in the desert regions, in particular in Samaria, was pretty hard to find. There were no rivers or streams close by to Sychar. So living water would mean a river or a stream, and there is none. It's just a well, uh, Jacob's well, but it's nonetheless just a well. This well, or this, this uh, metaphor of living water is what Jesus uses to get them to think differently. How living water comes in, flows through and out onto others through us. Sounds a lot to me like the Holy Spirit, which is what he talks about. We come to know Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit coming into us. That moves in us and then comes out of us and goes towards others around us. And it is a process that quenches our thirst. It is a process that allows us not to need anything else, only Jesus. Jesus says, I don't need anything. I don't need food. I don't need anything. I just need to do what God calls me to do. He likens it to reaping the harvest because he looks around and he sees all the people around him that do not yet see him as the Messiah. And he says, the harvest is there. It's time to bring them in. He's saying this to his disciples, the ones that have received the living water. And he's saying it to the Samaritans. Now that you've received the living water, I want you to take this and go out there and bring in the harvest. Bring your words to those who are ready to listen because it will change their souls. Now, the truth is, we know they're not always going to get that right. They're going to mess that up just like we do. But here's what Jesus does, is he makes it right even when we get it wrong. Because if we are doing our best for him, if we are living for him, then that living water flows through us and it makes a difference. Words you say that you think are all mixed up and wrong are the very words that he uses for other people to hear and know him better. That's because Jesus listens with love. His ears, his heart, his mind is set on loving everyone and inviting them into that love that he has for them. So our challenge this morning is to ask questions about listening. How do we really listen? Okay? Like the kids, you, you, you take one thing and you say it, and then another thing and say it, and it turns out differently. And sometimes that's good. But if you're doing what God intends you to do, no matter what you say, it will turn out right. It will turn out good because God in his grace and mercy makes it right because he loves us. So how do we really listen? And then based on how we, how we listen, what do we do? What are our actions? I think the key is listening to love and that's the challenge for us. Do we really listen with love? I know that I don't all the time. I suspect that you're a lot like me in that respect. There are people who we need to interact with. They're simply 
not very fun to be around. They're not good people, it doesn't seem to me. And so your heart and mind is already set hard against them. So if we love them, how do we hear them when, they're, when our heart is already hard toward them? What has to change? Those are con- uh, uh, words that need to convict us and change us. How do we listen to love if the person is just simply difficult? Somebody you like, you love, but they're just a difficult person or uh, somehow uh, they're a very confusing person or they're entirely different than you are or something like that. And, and you love them and you care about them, but sometimes it's very confusing in the process. How do you listen to, to that person in love in order to hear what they're really saying and then act accordingly? How do we listen out of our own experiences, our own ideas, our own past in a way that allows us to listen to what others are really saying? My experience and I think what, what uh, Jesus is trying to say is that people really are asking, do you accept me? Do you care about me? Maybe it's do you love me, if it's that point in the relationship. But people really want to be cared for. People really want to be loved. And so the challenge for us is how to listen in a way that we hear what they're really saying. That requires us to put a lot of our fears aside, some of our own experiences and ideas. We have to kind of hold back and weigh that and those kinds of things. So where are you at this morning? What kind of listener are you? Is there someone that you're not listening to? Maybe it's time to reevaluate that. Or maybe you're listening partially because you don't quite get it. Maybe it's time to figure out if there's a way to get it. Or maybe you're there, you're thoughtfully listening, and you're going to get it. That's great. Maybe you're being prepared for listening, or maybe you're preparing someone else to listen. I don't know. Wherever you are, wherever you are in your listening, you know that Jesus simply loves you no matter who you are, no matter what you've done. That to me is astounding and comforting and wonderful. He loves us no matter who we are or what we've done. And what he wants for us is what he wants here. He wants to give us that living water so that we, our thirst is always quenched, it never runs dry, and we will become, by his grace and mercy, who he wants us to be, and we will do what he wants us to do. I think the real challenge this morning here is to listen well. And that's going to take effort. It's going to take work, and sometimes we're not going to like it, but other times we are going to be so grateful that we did. So, people of God, let's listen well. Let's pray.